要那个谢呃谢谢那个吴院长这么好的 introduction， 然后呃我要谢谢 N H I 呃请我来，啊、呃，其实我台湾话讲的比我国语比较好嘛，国语迄个即个迄个即个用词我。啊，我我我无得表达，所以迄个我迄个，我呃，他是变成英英文，啊，这是我的迄个呃中中文名字迄个啊，因为我是一个那个心脏科的医生，所以我们做的都呃的方方方面都跟那个心脏科有关系，所以这个 talk 大部分都是在心脏科里里面的啊不同的 topic。Okay, this uh, this is my uh, disclosure uh, slide uh, here, and I think all of you know that um, you know many of the medications uh, that you take actually uh, may not work. So the topic here is imprecision medicine. This is the top ten uh, medications that are used in the U.S. in terms of the gross income. Uh, blue means it works. Red means it doesn't work. So, for example, if you take a look at the Bilify for schizophrenia, out of five people who take it, only helps one person. If you take Nexium, out of 24 people uh, who take it, it only helps uh, one person. That's why here the editorial says you know, it's a time for one person in a clinical trial. Now, about five, four or five years ago, President Obama set up the Precision Initiative in the U.S. Here the goal is trying to deliver the right treatment at the right time, every time to the right person. And a lot of this is uh, due to advances in big data, uh, advances in uh, next generation sequencing, uh, advances in uh, biomedical uh, data sets. And uh, in terms of the next generation sequencing, um, I think as all of you know, the cost for sequencing is uh, getting cheaper and cheaper uh, with low error rate, uh, low, uh, and then quite a you know, decent uh, response rate, although it's still not ideal. A lot of times it will take you about two to three months to be able to annotate uh, the data. The cost here has gone from 100 million uh, back in 2000 down to less than 1,000 right now. So actually in our lab, initially we sent it to uh, BGI and they were charging us at 900 Now we switched to the company in Korea, they charge us $800. So you see uh, investigators switch back and forth depending on the cost. Now, this is what the uh, clinicians want to know. The clinicians want to know that based on your DNA sequencing, you know, you should be able to predict the patient's phenotype. But I would tell you that this is actually very, 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 very difficult. And uh, the main reason is that for most common uh, diseases, there are hundreds of genetic risk variants with very small effects, so it's difficult to develop a clear picture of who's really at risk just based on DNA sequencing. Uh, the other issue is that uh, the DNA sequencing uh, doesn't capture the epigenomics, the transcriptomics, metabolomics, environmentalomics. Now, as a cardiologist, ideally, if I treat a patient with a beta blocker, a statin, an ACE inhibitor, uh, or whichever cardiac uh, medication, I want to be able to look at what's going on in the heart. For example, I want to take a biopsy of the patient's heart before and after the patient takes a beta blocker to see what is the effect of the medication on the beta blocker. But obviously, uh, that's not possible, and that's why for the past 10, 20 years, uh, I think a lot of people have been doing biomarker research by looking at the patient's blood, for example. And you know, if you stop and think about, does it really make sense that we're looking at the RNA sequencing signature of PBMC, which is mostly white blood cell, and trying to predict this gene expression signature of white blood cell to see how that affects the cardiomyocytes size or how that affects Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Uh, so I think right now, uh, with the IPSL technique, uh, I think this is a significant improvement. Uh, it's not the same as a patient's own heart tissues, but I would say it captures the patient's DNA and RNA and proteins and probably one of the best cell models uh, that we have for uh, studying underlying uh, human diseases of these days. Now, I think I'll be aware that uh, this was uh, discovered by Shinai Monaka back in 2006, uh, and um, he shared the Nobel Prize uh, in 2012. This is uh, one of the uh, few cases in which, uh, you know, it, only, it basically takes uh, six or seven years between the discovery and uh, the award of the Nobel Prize. The IPA cells can be generated from the patient's blood skin uh, by hitting it with four different uh, genes uh, right here. So once you hit it uh, and, and they convert the patient's somatic cells into IPA cells, these IPA cells, for all practical purposes, they're the same as your embryonic stem cells. And because the IPA cells and the embryonic stem cells are very similar, these IPA cells can uh, differentiate into heart cells, 
brain cells, pancreatic cells, hematopoietic cells, or whichever cells that you're uh, interested in. The technique is very crude uh, still. There's still a lot of room for improvement, the bi but the biology is there, meaning that ESL has to become your brain, your heart, your liver. Likewise, iPSL, very similar to ESL, has to be able to differentiate different uh, cell types. We just don't know enough about the differentiation, about the development process so far. So this is our workflow for generating human iPA cells at the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute. We recruit a lot of patients, and um, we generate iPA cells typically using uh, their uh, blood, and we hit it with the Sendai virus typically, and then we can uh, differentiate uh, typically into cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, and ad ad adipocytes, and then we set up these assays to help us uh, understand the biology of uh, these uh, cell types. And so, uh, you know, this is our differentiation protocol. It's a chemically defined generation of human cardiomyocytes. And we use uh, three components, uh, basal media, L-ascorbic acid, and human recombinant albumin. We like this protocol because it's much cheaper. Uh, you know, it probably costs you about $50 to generate a bottle of this uh, differentiation media compared to about $300 if you were to buy it from com uh, commercial vendors. Yeah, the advantage is that uh, there's no, uh, Xenogenic products, this is a, a fetal bovine serum, and sometimes a xenogenic product can screw up the uh, differentiation uh, process uh, right here. And so over the past uh, 15 years, I went to Stanford, as uh, Dr. Wu mentioned, in uh, 2004 uh, to set up my lab. At that time, we were using human ear cells, and our differentiation was very crude. You see that some of the cells are twitched right here, and but then you know, for a cardiologist, these are junk cells, meaning these could be pancreatic cells, liver cells, uh, brain cells that I'm not interested in. I'm really interested in the, uh, the uh, beating cardiomyocytes. And then uh, fast forward um, 14, 15 years later, instead of using human ear cells, we basically take your blood, isolate your PBMC, hit it with four genes, and differentiate the cardiomyocytes with 90% plus efficiency. And so this technique is getting better and better uh, with the passage of time. And these are some of the publications that we've uh, published. Now, so once you're able to do this, you should be able to essentially get everybody's uh, blood in this audience, uh, in this auditorium here, and then generate patient-specific and disease-specific, assuming some of us have some type of disease. Uh, in, this, in our case, we we'll differentiate the heart cells, but other people may want to differentiate to liver cells and kidney cells. And for the heart cells, we're able to generate cardiac organoids, uh, 3D cardiac organoids, as well as able to generate engineered heart tissues, uh, in, uh, in this case here. This would allow us to calculate the uh, systolic force, the diastolic relaxation, uh, and also in response to different uh, medications. So I want to show you some examples of how we do this. And for the sake of time, I will not cover cell transplantation, uh, how we use this for cell therapy, but I'll focus mostly on uh, how we use this to understand uh, disease, disease uh, especially rare diseases, uh, how we use this to, uh, for drug discovery, drug screening, how we use this for patient stratification, and how we use this for uh, clinical trial uh, in a dish. So in terms of uh, understanding uh, cardiovascular disease, this slide here shows a typical cardiomyocyte, and there are many diseases that could happen. Uh, for example, you can have a channelopathy that causes a long QT disease. You could have a CPVT uh, disease uh, right here. You could have ARVD uh, disease right here. You could have hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy disease here due to, for example, uh, mutations in sarcomere. And you could also do, have dilated cardiomyopathy due to mutations in sarcomere or due to mutations in the nuclear uh, membrane right here. And so many of these uh, diseases are quite rare. And again, in the past, it's not possible to study the cardiomyocytes, but now with IPA cells, you could do that. So I'll, I'll quickly highlight a few examples so that you can get a flavor of this. Um, so this is a familiar dilated cardiomyopathy. This is the most common diagnosis in patients who undergo heart transplant. And this is also the most common genetic uh, cause of cardiomyopathy. Affects one in 250 people. I mean, this audience is probably about 250 people. So one of us uh, would have a familiar dilated cardiomyopathy. You may or may not be aware of it at this moment. Now with increasing use of DNA sequencing, it's expected that we'll pick up more and more of these diseases here. Now, about uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, we were referred this family. Uh, this kid here, age 15, already had a heart transplant. Uh, his heart is really beat up, and it's, uh, you know, ejection fraction of 20%. It's 
uh, father, uncle, and uh, grandmother also has a dilated uh, cardiomyopathy phenotype. So it runs in the family, so we know this is familial uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. We decided to sequence uh, the patient, and it came back as a uh, troponin T or the alternate tryptophan switch. And then uh, the question that's being asked by a referring physician and the patient themselves is, how does this mutation cause this phenotype in, in this particular family here? And so uh, back then, uh, we set up these assays in which uh, we differentiated to a embryo body, uh, meaning take the patient's uh, skin or blood, generate his IPA cell, differentiate his cardiomyocytes, put the cardiomyocytes on a 64 multi electrode array. This embryo body is beating, and this allows us to, uh, to measure the contractility, and then we can then compare control healthy patients versus disease patient. We can also expose uh, the control uh, patients to a drug, norepinephrine, to stimulate exercise. And you can see that uh, the, with norepinephrine exposure, the beating rate goes up. On the other hand, for the dilated cardiomyopathy patient, with norepinephrine exposure, the beating rate goes up, but after two to three hours, it kind of poop out. This kind of makes sense because clinically, we can give these patients some inotrope agent, you know, to increase the heart rate, to increase the contractility, but over time, this is actually quite toxic to the patient. So, when, you know, we're not supposed to give uh, the medication, this type of medication for heart failure patients for a long period of time. Now, if you expose uh, these uh, cardiomyocytes to low dose of norepinephrine, not high dose, uh, over seven days, for example, you see the control uh, cardiomyocytes look fine. However, the disease cardiomyocyte with the uh, mutation, they have basically bursting of the sarcomeres uh, right here. So this is a very dramatic uh, phenotype. And I'll talk about phenotype, I'll talk about assays throughout my talk because a lot of time we spend um, you know, ways to develop new assays that allows us to distinguish the difference between normal patient as well as a disease that patient because this is essentially a new field uh, right now. And so, uh, to make a long story short, because the paper has already been published a while back, uh, we generated IPA cell from a seven member family uh, with this uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. And uh, compared to the healthy control, we were able to show the disease cells had alter regulation of the calcium ion, decreased contractility, abnormal distribution of the supplementary alpha actin, especially upon exposure to norepinephrine. And then you can treat it with um, beta blocker uh, to improve uh, the function of these cells, uh, recapitulating trial, uh, results from multiple uh, large uh, beta blocker uh, trials. Now, another disease, uh, this is a familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This affects in one in 500 people. More than 500 mutations identified. Clinically, they have outflow tract obstruction, very thick muscles. This is one of the most common causes of certain cardiac death in young adults. You've heard about uh, athletes, uh, high school kids who drop, uh, you know, drop dead in the football field or basketball court. This is what the co uh, coroner's office will be looking for. If the patient survives, this is what the cardiologist will be looking for in terms of uh, thick muscles on the uh, echocardiogram uh, here. Now, about uh, six years ago, uh, we were referred this family here uh, by our clinicians. The mother here has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is her MRI scan. And you can see the insistently this essentially obliteration of the LV cavity right here. She was symptomatic. Uh, she had eight kids, and two of the kids uh, right here also has uh, this phenotype. And when we did the sequencing, it came back to be myosin heavy chain seven alternate discipline switch. Uh, and it turns out kid number three and kid number eight also has the same uh, mutation, but has not manifested the phenotype yet. Uh, kid number eight is the youngest uh, kid in the family genotype positive, phenotype uh, ne negative. And so we were being asked, how does this mutation here cause uh, this phenotype? And again, traditionally you create a mouse model, but many times, many times when you generate a mouse model with this type of uh, dilated or hypertrophic pheno uh, cardiomyopathy, the mouse actually uh, has a normal phenotype, so you're not able to study it. And now we just have generate the uh, IPSR cardiomyocytes in the entire family, and then study them. And the uh, paper has already been published, so I'm just going to quickly highlight to show that the conclusion here is that this is one of the proposed mechanisms, out of many uh, potential mechanisms, that the mouse heavy chain 7 can increase into cell calcium, activates the infects and it causes hypertrophy. The calcium handling defects causes arrhythmia. You can block the arrhythmia by giving them a beta blocker as well as block the hypertrophy. You can also use the arrhythmia as a phenotypic screening acid to look for antiarrhythmic medications. This is lidocaine, bazillotine, and manolazine uh, here. Uh, another example, uh, this is uh, LV non-compaction. Uh, <coughs> this accounts for about 9% of 
for our children with primary cardiomyopathy, the third most prevalent form of cardiomyopathy, after dilated cardiomyopathy I explained, and after the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that I explained. Clinically, uh, these uh, uh, kids have hypertrophication of the LV, meaning that they have these holes uh, inside the left uh, ventricle, and they can present with uh, uh, various uh, phenotypes uh, here. So about five years, uh, five years ago, we were uh, referred this family by Dan Bernstein, who's one of our pediatric cardiologists. This kid here already has heart transplant, and two siblings uh, who also has some type of LV lung compaction. Father has some type of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, it's non-specific. The postdoc uh, was originally from Japan, and he also recruited another family uh, in which uh, this uh, girl here also has uh, LV lung compaction. This, uh, this, this is uh, the, uh, this kid's uh, explanted heart uh, right here. And then when we sequence both families, uh, both of them have a TBX20 mutation. One of them in T-box T domain, the other one in transactivated domain, and do a whole series of uh, in vitro analysis and also mouse uh, modeling. We're able to show that the TGA, abnormal TGA beta signaling is one of the uh, proposed uh, mechanisms causing the albedon compaction. Now, more recently, uh, we, about four years ago, we were referred this large family, actually a Chinese family, in which uh, several uh, family members have uh, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, atrial fibrillation. Uh, we sequenced the family, it came out to be a Lama mutation. Uh, two uh, family members that are normal, we generated the iPA cells uh, from disease and normal. We also did uh, genome editing to take the normal and make it uh, disease. And so I just take the disease and make it normal. And uh, we differentiate the cardiomyocytes to show that the lambda mutated uh, IPSR cardiomyocytes have a whole bunch of abnormal phenotype, abnormal contraction, abnormal uh, electrophysiology. From a mechanistic standpoint, we're able to show that the lambda mutation uh, causes a haploinsufficiency due a nonsense mediated decay uh, pathway. We also use a tax seq uh, to show that uh, the abnormal nuclear uh, envelope uh, causes uh, abnormal lambda associated domain. And this actually causes uh, some of the genes that are supposed to be silenced to be activated. And the activation of these uh, supposedly uh, silenced genes actually cause the abnormal phenotype. When we did the RNA sequencing, we found that uh, one of the genes uh, that was uh, abnormally activated is PD PDGF uh, pathway. And we then uh, screened for a whole library of medications. Uh, and we were able to come out with two hits, uh, sunitinib and, uh, and quinunidib. And both of them, both of these uh, medications can be used to reverse the uh, phenotype. So mechanistically, uh, the, these are the normal patients and disease patients. The normal patients have normal uh, lamin uh, protein, normal nuclear structure, normal uh, lamin associated uh, domain. The disease patients have abnormal nuclear structure right here, and abnormal lamin associated domain causes uh, some of these uh, genes that are supposed to be silenced to be activated. And then activation of uh, some of these things also cause uh, downstream activation of other set of genes, including PDGF. And, uh, and so this is the uh, uh, proposed uh, mechanism. But again, now you can do all these studies uh, using human iPSR cardiomyocytes. You don't have to resort to mouse models of uh, these uh, cardiomyocytes. So th these are examples of hypertrophic dilated albumin compaction. Uh, working with uh, Jeff Mokenton's group, we've also used this uh, to look at the modeling for uh, dilated and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We've also uh, used this uh, to look at uh, cardiac-specific uh, differentiation at different stages. Uh, and then we've also uh, used a single-cell uh, platform uh, to understand uh, what some of the cardiac transcription factors are during the differentiation process. Now, you're not limited to generating cardiomyocytes. For example, you can also generate IPSL-derived cardiac fibroblasts. And this then allows you to study cardiac fibrosis uh, here. Um, so moving on to the second uh, aspect, how we could do this in a, a quote-unquote clinical trial uh, in a dish uh, right here. This is uh, back in April 2015. There's an announcement that Takeda is funding CERA. CERA is a, a research institute uh, set up by Shinra Yamanaka. Back then, it's about $270 million to use IPA cells for drug discovery and use IPA cells for cell therapy. Now, um, you know, Shedia, he's not like a demigod in Japan, so he gets a lot of this uh, uh, money uh, from the uh, Japanese government. But in the U.S., it's much tougher for us uh, because, you know, we have to apply for NIH grants and just uh, similar to the investigators uh, here in Taiwan. I just want to highlight that this is April 2015, and this is August of 2017. Less than two years later, 
and they came out with a hit, and this is uh, using patients uh, with uh, fibro uh, dysplasia progressiva ossificans, uh, ossificans progressiva FOP, very, very rare disease in which your skeletal muscle, your tendons ossify and becomes bone, and then the patient basically cannot move. In Japan, it's estimated that they only have like 80 of these uh, patients, and they recruited these patients, generated the IPA cell, and then they're able to replicate some of these symptoms outside the body. They screened for 6,000 medications, and they came out with a hit rapamycin, and then now doing a phase one clinical trial involving 20 of these uh, patients uh, right now. So this tells you that you know this method can be used to accelerate drug discovery at platform, because now, instead of using traditional models, you basically uh, take the patient and then do a quote-unquote personalized drug screen to come up with some of these uh, hits. So, we're interested in this from a cardiac standpoint, and uh, you know this is a proposed uh, idea by Shane Yamanaka in which you can take IPA cell, different, different cell types, and then you can set up uh, an assay to figure out who responds and who doesn't respond, and then uh, this then allows you to have, have a higher hit rate and uh, lower uh, error rate uh, in terms of your phase one, phase two uh, clinical trials. Now for this uh, schema, uh, you know, we're interested in understanding responsiveness, uh, prediction, and so from a cardiology uh, standpoint, uh, you know, we differentiate uh, quite a bit to cardiomyocytes. So one idea that we have is that we're right now doing routine uh, RNA sequencing on these uh, IPA cell cardiomyocytes generated from patients. And this title here shows that you can do RNA seq to predict individual drug safety and efficacy responses in vitro. The idea is that we take patients generated cardiomyocytes and then expose them to medications, in this case here, versus glitazone to colomus, and use RNA sequencing and also use a genome editing to help us confirm or uh, deny whether the hits that we have are true or false. And then uh, you could then go back and go back and go back and to uh, reiterate the whole process to improve your uh, prediction of these drug responses. So this is uh, back in 2016, and then more recently, we've also developed uh, what we call a double reporter system that will allow us to improve the drug response profiles uh, right here. Again, we're very much interested in drug screening, drug discovery. This is a double reporter in which it's got a TBX uh, driving Clover, and it's also got NKX uh, uh, driving RIP. Uh, and so if you're double positive, TBX positive, NKX positive, it can allow you to isolate for ventricular-like cells. If you're TBX are negative and uh, NKX positive, allows you to isolate uh, uh, second heart for your atrial like cells. If you're TBX positive and NKX are negative, it allows you to isolate epic, uh, cardio cells. If you're double negative, it allows you to uh, isolate endothelial cells. So you can imagine what we're doing with these type of cell lines. We'll basically take these type of cell lines, do drug screening to see which one the drug allows us to push toward one cell type uh, versus another cell type. And once you're able to get these cell types, it's very important. For example, if you're, able, if you're able to get pure atrial cells, well, now you can study atrial fibrillation and use uh, these uh, pure atrial cells uh, to look for medications, or anti arrhythmic medications that are, uh, can be used to blunt atrial fibrillation. Now, the other aspect is the ethic uh, groups uh, in terms of how we respond to medications, and this is also something that we're very much uh, interested in. And you know, in the U.S., we're quite diverse uh, compared to uh, Taiwan uh, here. But you know, the diversity also brings a certain aspect, meaning that you can give the same group of people, uh, you can give uh, this group of people the uh, same medication, but then the effect is going to be very different depending on your ethnic uh, makeups, uh, depending on your genetic uh, makeup. So, for example, uh, in the U.S., uh, we're interested in studying why is it African Americans have much more incidence of these uh, essential hypertension, why is it Hispanics have uh, diabetic uh, vasculopathy, South Asians, these are Indians and Pakistanis, and why is it that they have normal uh, BMI and yet they have a metabolic uh, syndrome? And because I'm an East Asian, uh, I'm interested also in studying aldehyde dehydrogenase. So about four, five, uh, so this is interesting. I think all of you are aware that uh, many East Asians uh, uh, lack this uh, particular enzyme. About 36% of East Asians causes alcohol plus a reaction. We treat alcoholics by giving them antibiotics to block the same enzyme. And then uh, this is what caught my eyes uh, about five years ago uh, to show that uh, if you're missing this uh, particular uh, enzyme, it's associated with increased uh, cancer, more complications, diabetes, hypertension, and also increased risk of a coronary artery disease with more severe outcome after myocardial infarction. 
And uh, so about five years ago, I had a, a German postdoc, Antje Ieber, uh, who's now a faculty uh, in Germany. Uh, she was interested in this uh, a particular uh, study. So we recruited Stanford undergrads who are East Asians, and five of them are uh, wild type, and five of them are heterozygous. It's actually quite uh, rare to have these uh, homozygous, uh, it's, uh, so it's actually quite difficult to recruit these uh, homozygous, mus uh, homozygous mutant. But what we did is essentially set up a myocardial infarction uh, model by giving these uh, cells hypoxia to simulate a heart attack. And you can see that uh, during hypoxia, the, the uh, wild type uh, tolerated the stress, there's less apoptosis, whereas the heterozygous, they couldn't tolerate the stress, there's much more apoptosis. So to make a long story short, what we think is happening is that during heart attack, you're gonna have tons of uh, reactive oxygen species activated, and the wild type can get rid of the boss, but whereas the mutant, the heterozygous and the homozygous, have a harder time getting rid of the boss, and you end up with more cell with death, and perhaps uh, that may be a mechanism of why uh, patients with this particular deficiency ends up with more severe outcomes after a heart attack. <coughs> And so this is one of the first uh, demonstrations using race-specific iPA cells. And again, you will see examples of people take a drug, give it to 100 patients in different ethnic groups, and see what is the heterogeneity of this uh, drug response in these uh, 100 uh, folks. Now moving on to the, uh, another aspect, which is a patient stratification. This gets to be very personalized right now. Uh, because I'll show you a couple examples uh, here. This is uh, Geisinger, a previous uh, CEO of Geisinger, um, and what back in 2018, what uh, Geisinger is a pretty large uh, healthcare group in Northeast uh, USA. And what they wanted to do is uh, provide uh, free DNA sequencing to their patients. And they want to make it as routine as checking cholesterol. And um, in reality, what the healthcare uh, system wants to do is catch its genetic information and then partner with drug companies uh, to use uh, the DNA, use the clinical information and to help uh, these, some of these uh, drug companies to come up with uh, better drugs. But you know, this has actually uh, had a big fanfare. Uh, but about a month later, uh, there's uh, several editorials, and I just want to read verbatim this editorial here. Uh, it says, uh, yeah, Geisinger's rhetoric describing DNA sequencing misleads what the technology is capable of doing today, likely in the future. We are preventing disease from happening. It's inaccurate because few diseases at a single cause are purely genomic basis very similar to what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, and so this is uh, happening real time, right? People are getting DNA sequence. I'm not sure how many of you have gotten your DNA sequence. I have gotten my DNA sequence, and you're gonna have a lot of stuff that you don't know how to interpret your uh, data. So I'll give you one example. Uh, this is a 45-year-old man. Uh, he's very worried because uh, this is him. His brother and his uncle, both of them have uh, syncope. Both of them passed out. And then he was uh, seeing in our EP, uh, EP clinic, prolonged QT uh, corrected, 507, usually normal is about 430. Um, and you know, we uh, decided to start him on a beta blocker uh, prophylactically. We also did a genetic testing, and it came back as a variant of unknown significance, VUS, uh, in a long QT2 uh, mutation, KCNS2. Problem is that if we had sequenced the brother and the uncle, and both of them have this particular variance, this will give us uh, more confidence that this variant is causing the symptom. But both the uncle and the brother refuse uh, genotype testing. So what do you do in this case right here, in the clinical case right here? And so right now, our advice is that, well, we, just, we don't know what to do. We're just gonna follow you, come back to our clinic next year. If you passed out, let us know, call us, uh, you know. But otherwise, we don't know until somebody else publishes a paper in, uh, in uh, Jack or Circulation, somebody else from um, uh, Sweden published a paper, same family, same variant, and show that this is a pathogenic variant or benign variant. Otherwise, we just wait and wait and wait. And so this case was uh, referred to us. Um, and they asked us to help them adjudicate what this particular variant means. So this is what we did. We took uh, IPA cell from him. And remember, his brother and his uncle the head ones nothing to do with it. And his IPSL cardiomasa actually has a lot of arrhythmia compared to normal patient. And his IPSL cardiomasa, when we make genome edit to make a homozygous copy, more arrhythmia pop up. And when we genome edit to remove that variant, uh, the arrhythmia went away. And when we genome edit to take that variant and put it into a normal patient, for example, into my IPSL, 
my, uh, this tons of arrhythmia in my IP is not totally my sex. And based on these four steps here, we basically concluded that this is probably a pathogenic variant and not a benign variant right here. So instead of waiting for 10, 20, 30 years, now we're able to shrink it into you know, a couple of years. Uh, this project took us about two years because the reviewers asked for a lot of stuff. Uh, but in the future, you should be able to get this thing done in six uh, months. Uh, I just want to qualify by saying that this is not CLIA certified at this moment. This is essentially basic research uh, uh, at this moment. But here, our conclusion is that our IPSL tests suggest that this particular variant may be classified as poten uh, potentially uh, pathogenic uh, here. Now, let me give you another example. Uh, this is also referred to as healthy middle-aged uh, patient, uh, him, a uh, 45 year old, decided to get DNA sequencing for routine checkup. So at Stanford, we have these uh, concierge clinic in which, you know, besides your regular insurance, you want to pay $600, $700 out of pocket each month to a different doctor, and that allows you to have 24-7 access to the doctor, usually for the VIP patients. And the uh, doctor will a lot of times order whole body scans or whole ge uh, you know, genome testing because you're a VIP, they want to cater to your uh, wishes. So this guy got a, a whole genome sequence and it came back as pathogenic, pathogenic uh, variant in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, myosin 19 uh, 3. Now, he tells you he's perfectly fine and his brother, his mother, and his daughter also has a particular variant, but they're fine. And so looking at this kind of information, what would you do as a cardiologist? Or are you going to say, well, it says, you know, all we look fine, we're just going to follow you. And there's no published report about this particular variant. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it's not big enough uh, data set. We're just going to keep on following you. Now, what if, uh, you know, he, next month, he flies from San Francisco to Taipei. Long flight, economy class, develop a deep venous thrombosis causes a pulmonary embolism, dies out of a son. Young guy who dies out of a son, the coroner's office did not find out it's a pulmonary embolism. Coroner's office say, well, young guy who dies out of a son, this is probably some kind of death, right? And the wife, who's actually a lawyer, what is the wife gonna do? <laughs> uh, it's gonna sue you and say, hey doc, you know, you sequence my husband, and it's a pathogenic variant that could cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. How come you didn't do anything about it? Right? Now, because you're the concierge doc, and that means that uh, you get 24-7 access by the patient to you, and uh, you decide to cover yourself legally by doing echo, Holter, cardiac MRI, whole bunch of tests, a lot of tests, a lot of money. You probably make him more worried, and this guy's a business uh, man, so next time, 3 o'clock in the morning, he's having a hard time uh, meeting a deadline, and he has some skip beat because he drank too much coffee. And because of these are skip beats, who is he going to call? He's not going to call his Kaiser doc. He's going to call the doc that he already paid $800 per month out of pocket for 24-7 access. So you're going to get a lot of phone calls from this guy right here. So this is real case examples. These are not made up examples of how things are progressing. So this was also referred to us. And in his case uh, here, his IPSL actually looked normal, very normal. And when we make it a double uh, copy, uh, uh, of this uh, particular mutant. It also look uh, normal. When we introduce uh, a frame shape, it also look normal. And then when we introduce a well-known pathogenic variant into uh, his cell line, we started seeing the hypertrophic phenotype arrhythmia. When we introduce a well-known variant into a normal cell line, we started seeing the abnormality, telling us there's nothing wrong with our genome editing uh, technique. And based on these uh, uh, three to four uh, steps here, we basically went back and say, uh, actually, even though it's called as likely pathogenic, based on these IPSL stuff, uh, we, uh, we think it's actually more benign uh, variant uh, here. So you will see uh, that people talk about precision medicine, people talk about uh, DNA sequencing. Problem with uh, DNA sequencing is that you're gonna end up with tons and tons and tons of these busts. And this is the Achilles heel because it's very difficult clinical interpretation, risk assessment challenges, personal psychosocial impact, high emotional stress uh, for the carriers of family. And you will see that uh, in the U.S., you'll see some starter companies that will use uh, these case-specific cardiomyocytes and genome editing to assess the uh, pathogenicity of these of us in the future. Now, the last area that I'll cover is uh, drug discovery, drug development, drug screening. This is also a big uh, topic here. I'm not sure if you're aware, but all the drugs that need to be tested for cardiac uh, toxicity uh, in the U.S. 
and actually internationally. And the way we test for cardiac toxicity traditionally has been we use CHO cells and HEX cells overexpress the HERG receptor, and then we put the drug in to see whether the HERG uh, blocks the potassium channel. And then, you know, if it blocks it, then we're going to kill the drug. Obviously, you know, probably doesn't make a lot of sense to be testing drugs on hamster, Chinese hamster ovary cells, you know, with human kidney, uh, embryonic kidney cells, especially if we're looking for arrhythmia, right? And so uh, this is a uh, publication recently by the FDA, uh, Cassinia and David Strauss and Norman Stockbridge, they're both at the, uh, they are at the FDA. Uh, in this case, you're able to, uh, to show that uh, they use uh, two uh, human cell lines and three different continents, uh, 28 different drugs, two, st two statistical models, and then uh, test, basically testing a whole bunch of these drugs and these IPSL cardiomyocytes. And then and the conclusion is that the validation study confirms the utility of using EP uh, electrophysiology responses to 28 blinded drugs with the minimal influence in cell lines, test sites, and also the various uh, platforms uh, here. Now, the leading causes of death in the U.S. are heart disease and cancer. So, as I mentioned, I'm a cardiologist, and we're very interested in the interaction between heart and cancer because a lot of the cancer patients get referred to us, and also a lot of the cancer medications have cardiac uh, toxicity. And so I'll just show you one example. Um, this is uh, the title here says that you can use a human IPSL cardiomyocyte to recapitulate the predilection of breast cancer patients with doxorubicin induced cardiac toxicity. If you're a breast cancer patient, most likely you're gonna get uh, doxorubicin. And it, probably eight to 10% of the patients would have uh, cardiac toxicity when the doxorubicin used to be much higher, but now we dropped the dose uh, so that um, this is uh, less uh, prevalent uh, here. The idea here is that we don't know which woman's gonna develop disease, but this is a modeling study in which uh, we recruited uh, breast cancer patients uh, who had doxorubicin. A year later, some of them had normal cardiac function, some of them have a cardiomyopathy. Here, we generate the iPA cell, differentiated cardiomyocytes, expose their cardiomyocytes to doxorubicin, we set up various assays so that all goal is to try to use a cardiomyocyte to predict who's going to have cardiotoxicity and who does not have cardiotoxicity. And so 12 patients, uh, quote unquote clinical trial in the dish, four healthy, no breast cancer, four patients with the breast cancer uh, received doxorubicin and nothing happened to them. We call them docs. Four patients with breast cancer who received doxorubicin developed toxicity. We call them doxorubicin toxicity or docs tox. You can see here, a 40-year-old woman, ejection fraction went from 77 down to 36. 30-year-old woman, ejection fraction went from 70 down to 45. But very young woman received doxorubicin, cardiac function dropped, most likely due to the uh, cardiac toxicity from the doxorubicin, not due to valvular disease, not due to uh, heart attacks and so forth here. So we generate IPSL cardiomyocytes in an entire cohort. Um, and uh, just uh, the punchline here is that when you expose the cardiomyocytes, and a dox group versus dox tox group. For example, at one micromolar, there's much more sarcomeric disarray in the dox group versus toxicity group. At one micromolar, uh, there's a much more toxicity, uh, much more apoptosis in the dox tox group. And then one micromolar, uh, the dox tox group has cessation of beating compared to the uh, dox group. And also, there's much more cell death. So, this is very interesting because ever since when I was a cardiology fellow, the epidemiologists, the cardiologists have been trying to use GWAS studies, genome-wide association studies, to find out which person with a particular SNP confers protection or risk from uh, doxorubicin uh, cardiac toxicity. On a population level, you can come up with nice p-values and say this SNP confers protection. On an individual person level, I think it's almost, from a clinician standpoint, in my opinion, it's useless. Mainly because I may have a SNP that confers protection against doxorubicin, but I'm not aware that I may be missing 20 other SNPs that causes increased risk. And so just by focusing the SNP gives you a false uh, uh, readout. Now the cell here is essentially encompassing all the DNA, all the RNA, all the SNPs. It's giving you a readout. It's almost like a mini chip. And so what happens if your uh, IP cell cardiomyocytes gets exposed to, uh, to the doxorubicin? It's not as good as your own heart but it's probably much better than just looking at the SNPs and trying to uh, find out. Now, uh, for the breast cancer patients, another medication they take is a Herceptin. 
uh, Herceptin also causes cardiac toxicity. Traditionally, it's been tough to study this particular disease in mouse model because the mouse uh, cardiomyocytes actually do not express the receptor that the Herceptin uh, binds to. So we were uh, very fortunate that Genentech uh, gave us uh, some of these uh, medications for us to test. In this case here, we recruited patients uh, who had Herceptin-induced cardiac toxicity. We classified them as non-toxic, moderately uh, toxic, as well as severely toxic. Generally, IPSR cardiomyocytes exposed them to uh, Herceptin. And then in addition, we screened for medications and were able to come up with uh, several hits or some, uh, some medications that could be reversed, could be used to reverse uh, this uh, particular phenotype. And then lastly, uh, besides uh, doxorubicin and Herceptin, you could also look at tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, these are very common uh, medications that uh, patients uh, use, take uh, for various types of uh, cancers. And many of these uh, TKIs are also associated with cardiac toxicity, associated with hypertension, associated with cardiac arrhythmia, associated with the heart failure here. In this case here, um, we screened for 21 most common uh, TKIs, and we set up uh, various assays, conservability, electrophysiology, calcium handling, and then we differentiate the cardiomyocytes, also endothelial cells and uh, fibroblasts. And really, uh, this is the typical uh, setup that we have in our lab. We recruit patients, generate the heart cells, expose them to the drugs, set up these assays, and screen for uh, toxicity uh, to see uh, what's going on. And we uh, also come up with this very crude index. In this case here, uh, it's a cardiac safety index uh, for TKI toxicity. So if you, if you have a low safety index, it typically means that the drug is uh, not safe. Ventitinib, nolitinib, for example, both of them uh, easily picked up, uh, shows Tosat, shows cardiac arrhythmia on the IPSL cardiomyocyte model. Both of them were missed in preclinical studies using mouse style models. Both of them now have uh, black box warnings. Again, this is not a perfect, uh, but I think it gives you the point that as of today, we can come up with these uh, safety index and then with more validations, with more iterations of this cardiac safety index, it will get better and better. And obviously, you can imagine that we work quite a bit with drug companies who are developing TKIs and using this particular assays to help them find out how toxic it is from the cardiac standpoint for their tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Now, there are other chemos that you can look at. And I think right now, for example, uh, this is very hot uh, these days. It's a checkpoint inhibitors. And you could also look at the alkylating agents. And I'll show you examples of TKIs, uh, acceptance, as well as doxorubicin uh, here. So in summary, essentially, uh, this is what we do in our lab. I'm a uh, clinical cardiologist, and I uh, see patients. I get referrals uh, from our clinical colleagues. Many, uh, we have a lot of patients. We know the clinical phenotype. And for many patients, uh, they have been sequenced uh, for the right reason or for the wrong reason. And this is what most hospitals, most institutions have. The problem is you don't have a way to validate your data, and therefore now you can use IPA cells and genome editing to help you further adjudicate what happens uh, to uh, some of these uh, rare disease uh, patients. So uh, as part of our effort to do this, uh, we've uh, created a biobank. Right now we have more than 1,000 patients IPA cell generated at Stanford. Uh, different sex, ethnicity, uh, we also uh, perform DNA seq on these uh, patients and also RNA seq uh, in response to some kind of medications because we want to create an encyclopedia of drug responses of IPSL cardiomyocytes and endothelial cells. We link it to the following GK database so that we want to understand how the human genetic variation impacts drug response. We link it to the medical information so all the lines that we have, we have the clinical information so we can follow them for the next five years, 10 years, 15 years use the IPA cells uh, for some of our basic research studies. We also work with the NIH and CIRM and also with the FDA and drug safety testing. And we've also established a very robust sharing plan. In fact, we've sent our cells to many investigators uh, here in Taiwan, uh, in Academia Seneca, in um, uh, NTU uh, as well. And so uh, for a shameless plug, I, I just want to highlight um, we're very much interested in drug discovery, and uh, we have a uh, Stanford Drug Discovery Symposium that I organize every year. It's always April, and uh, last year, uh, you know, we had uh, we gave out a uh, lifetime achievement award to Roy Vatilos uh, for his contribution to statin medications. Some of the uh, speakers and the CEOs of the uh, major uh, companies, and then this year, this past April. 
uh, and we gave our Lifetime Achievement Award to John Martin, who was the previous CEO of Gilead, for his contribution to uh, antiretroviral medications, mostly HIV uh, medications, and then some of the speakers here are in the previous uh, FDA commissioners and so forth. And then I would encourage you to be, if you have time, to visit us in April uh, 21st, 22nd, uh, 2020. We will be giving our Lifetime Achievement Award to Doug Lowry and John Schuller uh, for their contribution for HPV vaccine, which I think has really made a big impact on our society. And uh, with that, I want to thank my uh, postdoc fellows and the funding, my graduate students uh, and their funding, the um, instructors in the lab and their funding. Many of them are looking for jobs right now. Uh, the, uh, the cardiology fellows and my former postdoc that I mentioned their work and my uh, collaborators at Stanford, collaborators uh, outside of Stanford. If you're interested in some of these cells, we're happy to send it to you. We don't ask for authorship. We just ask to send it to you for your, uh, we have costs, and this is my funding support. And thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much.